Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this week's Two Minute Warning feature interview, where we take a deeper dive at this massive push from oil, gas, energy towards decarbonization, um, of course, occurring here in the Middle East, as well as globally, hoping to uncover some insights that will help people navigate somewhat of a, a bumpy road ahead. It's two minutes to midnight, and I'm joined here today with our featured guest speaker, Ramzi Page, Principal at Strategy and Middle East. Thanks for joining the show. Happy to be here. I just wanted to kick off um, essentially with your outlook, your short-term outlook for renewable energy in the GCC. I know you co-authored a report not too long ago, ago um, saying that it was mostly sunny with a chance of rain. Uh, I just wanted to see if that is still the case to this day. Well, it is still the case. Uh, before we go into the, the short-term outlook, maybe on the long-term long -term perspective, I mean, we, we know that the GCC has set ambitious uh, renewable energy targets for the long term, mainly driven by Saudi Arabia, around 60 gigawatts by 2030. The UAE has plans for 9 gigawatts by 2025 and 50% of that uh, energy generation production in the long term from clean energies. Qatar is also setting up a renewable energy strategy, which hopefully will have significant targets considering its system size. And what we've seen uh, over the past couple of years is a significant traction. Saudi Arabia has already re released three rounds, uh, which amount to around 3.2 gigawatts. Uh, and they're going to release uh, around five, uh, four and five very soon, which will also have uh, capacities in the, in the gigawatts, hopefully. Uh, so they are definitely moving in the right, the right direction. When it comes to the UAE, the current installed capacity is around 2.4 gigawatts, but they do have projects in the pipeline. There's currently a two gigawatt uh, project under design and development. The, the, the Al Dahbar uh, in Abu Dhabi. So, so things are moving, there is progress. And what's important is that it's, it's aligned globally with the yearly capacity additions that we typically see, right? We, within our current system, around 1.5 to 2 gigawatts of incremental capacity uh, is, is, is the benchmark. Mm. I just wanted to touch on a point that we, we get from all of our stakeholders. Um, and it's the technology aspect. You know, we tend to be in this somewhat pilot phase, uh, but there is a, a kind of a challenge in terms of scaling up. And of course, you know, with more technology development, you're reducing costs as a benefit as well in the long term. Are you seeing the scaling up process starting to occur, or do you still see that somewhat as a speed bump ahead? No, I think the the, the scale of the projects that we're seeing in the region are massive. Uh, you have projects of, of 300, uh, 400 gigawatts in Qatar, there's an 800 megawatt solar PV facility. These are massive scale uh, capacities being introduced to the system in, in, in one shot. Uh, typically, when we see it, what we see in the US and in Europe are capacities of around 50 to 100, uh, 150 megawatts. So I think scale is very important in the region uh, and it's playing in their favor. Uh, and this is leading to significantly uh, low levelized cost of energy. Mm. Do you think the you know, part of scaling, of course, is driving in more investment? You know, we were having a climate finance actually podcast last week. Uh, mm -hmm. Someone mentioned that last year was kind of a record year in terms of green investments. Mm -hmm. uh, but then again, looking forward, we're going to have to have a record year every year in order to even have a chance at you know, meeting our targets. Um, do you see that, that finance still being a challenge in the region? Um, or do you, do you think the, the opportunities are there and the ecosystems are in place to to basically draw that in? I think the opportunity is there. Uh, and to prove that it's a big part of the uh, renewable energy cost comes from financing. Uh, the module price is the same around the world, right? The key differentiator is, is, is the financing. And the fact that we are achieving such a low cost of energy in these renewable energy projects, whether it's both in wind and in solar, uh, means that we are achieving very low cost financing in these projects. Obviously, uh, we can do more. Having uh, green funds will further propel this whole initiative. But, but I think financing is not an issue here in the region so far. I just want to take a, a step back. And of course, you know, advancing renewable energy opportunities and goals is one thing. But then setting a net zero target is kind of its own challenge in itself. And of course, we've seen the UAE, for example, Saudi, set net zero targets to major oil and gas producing countries. Um, are you starting to see essentially those net zero ambitions being translated into action in the oil and gas industry, uh, essentially uh, in the overall 
nations that have declared net zero targets? Sure. Uh, so the good part is we've seen commitments, right? Uh, the UAE has, uh, has a target by 2050, Saudi is by 2060. So this is the first step. The second step is to develop a comprehensive net zero strategy. And we are also seeing that uh, kicking off uh, very recently uh, within the region. Uh, the, the, so this is moving forward. And there are many elements that need to be considered in these strategies, uh, but it is definitely moving in the right direction in the region. Where do you see, uh, that's kind of along the lines of what we see as well in terms of, you know, you, you have the visions, you have the announcements, but of course the next step is implementation what mm -hmm. that blueprint looks like in that, that roadmap. Where do you see the, the role of partnerships playing to, to help on the implementation phase? Um, is that going to be a major pillar moving forward, of course, within the GCC, international partnerships? Uh, do you see that accelerating? So, so partnerships are, are, are definitely important because in order to drive decarbonization, you, there are many elements that needs to be taken into account. One of them is, is, is technology. And you need to build technology and develop technology and partnership is a key factor in order to do that. Mm. But if, if I may, just on the, on the net zero front, on all these strategies, right, what, 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 and as I said, developing a strategy is very important, but if we highlight what are the key elements that need to be considered in a strategy. So there are four key elements that needs to be considered. One, and this comes back to the partnerships, it's, it's technology. What is the technologies or what are the technologies that we need to focus on uh, in order mm. to enable that? But also, how are these technologies and sectors interlinked together, and what are the, what is the, 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 the geography? So where do we need to deploy these technologies? So that's one one element that needs to be considered. The second element that needs to also be considered is: Do we abate today or do we abate tomorrow? As you know, some technology is is commercially viable and it's it's profitable. Others are not. So what is the optimal pathway that 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 the UAE or Saudi Arabia needs to needs to take into account? to make sure that they are achieving their targets, but while at the same time, minimizing the cost on the economy, right? We wanna make sure that, that we are also minimizing costs on the economy and then making it sustainable. It's that balance of people profit planet, essentially. Absolutely, absolutely. We, we need to think about it from a government perspective, right? Uh, the third element is, is, is what are the policies and the measures that we need to put in place to drive differentiated moonshots? And what I mean by moonshots are, what are the technological big bets the UAE, Saudi Arabia needs to needs to focus on to to drive their ambitious targets. Something, for example, like green hydrogen. Should they double down on R and D in green hydrogen to make it uh, cost efficient and cost competitive? I was just going to ask you if that was a moonshot, essentially. It is, it is, it is. But there are so many in the, for the region. And the last part is is engagement. Engage, engage, engage. So what we've seen is the shortfalls of, of many strategies around the world, specifically around our environmental strategies, is that you create that great strategy on a piece of paper, but you don't go engage with the stakeholders to get buy-in. And then it gets you know, in the drawer and you don't implement it. So we need to build the proper mechanisms that establish this, this collaboration and this buy-in between the various stakeholders to be able to drive the implementation of that strategy. What might be a mechanism that you've seen in other, uh, let's say best case studies in terms of that engagement and driving that engagement. So all these things, as you said, it requires all stakeholders to be on board and working together to achieve these targets. Absolutely. So, so, so you need to have the proper governance in place that attracts the various stakeholders. Uh, and, 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 that gov and as you're developing your strategy, you need to uh, engage with these stakeholders as you go, because you need to develop it with them so that they feel that they also have ownership and they have buy-in. And what's also very important is that their voice needs to be heard. It's, mm -hmm. not, it's, it's not just straightforward to impose certain targets or to impose certain considerations on the players. You need to build it with them because we need to understand what are their constraints and what are their limitations. So, so having the proper governance that keeps on, on a continuous basis, engaging with the stakeholders, engaging with the industrial sector to hear their concerns and try to mitigate them to develop a comprehensive uh, and, and implementable strategy. Mm. One of the key aspects of engagement as well is having the right talent and skill set. Um, you know, things we mentioned, technology is accelerating rapidly. Um, sustainability overall, I imagine sustainability uh, workers are probably in massive demand at the moment. Mm -hmm. We actually just mm -hmm. saw a new chief technology officer now also become chief sustainability officer um, at Sabic, for example. But are you seeing that there's a massive drive in the region to 
uh, want to attract that talent. Um, you know, let's say the, the oil and gas industry has always had a certain reception about it. You know, if you're looking at the younger generation of talent, um, are you seeing a drive in the region to attract that talent, one, and then to upskill that talent in order to uh, help drive these net zero targets and ambitions? So yes, yes. What, what we are seeing is, is both uh, an organic and an inorganic uh, growth in talent. Let me start with the inorganic. The inorganic growth of talent is we're seeing it through the the, the, the transition of, of capabilities to the region from abroad, right? Mm -hmm. Bringing in the, 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 the European, the American, the Asian talent to the region to drive the, the, the all the way from, from you know, project design to development implementation. And we're seeing that uh, happening significantly. But there's also, which is very important, the organic growth. And when we look at uh, university curriculums, we see that there's introduction of these, whole, these, these renewable energy programs, these sustainability programs, and obviously this is more of a long-term agenda, but at least we're seeing this happening uh, and, and it'll have a very positive impact in the future. Mm. And as this, let's say, this is a, an ecosystem as its own uh, being created throughout the region. Uh, we mentioned hydrogen earlier, and I imagine this, this kind of translates over to just energy in general. Um, do you see the region uh, becoming a major hub, I'll use hydrogen as an example, um, for hydrogen, or do you see it uh, becoming a major exporter of, of an example of hydrogen. So for, we, we've had these conversations where whether or not you set up uh, you know, smart hubs that can produce low carbon steel, or if you try to export it directly as a, as a, as a fuel. What, it, what do you think is the best path, path of the region to take forward um, when looking at these moonshot ideas? To be honest, I see it a bit differently. I see it as a, as a journey. Uh, and, and, and the way I see it is the following. I think it's, 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 it's very clear for everyone that the region here has significant competitive advantage when it comes to uh, low cost green hydrogen production, uh, given the, 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 the very low cost renewables and the massive uh, availability of barren land that can be leveraged. Uh, I mean, we forecast the price of green hydrogen to be, to be around the, the, the $1.5 per kilogram by the 2035s. Right, so which is wow. extremely low compared to, to gray and blue hydrogen, again, mainly driven by renewables, but also advancements in capital cost of, of electrolysis. Now, the way we see it as a journey is the following. Uh, you need to build up your hydrogen economy. And obviously the first thing to do is to produce the hydrogen, right? Mm. And uh, you can produce the hydrogen, set up the proper export infrastructure and ship it. And we believe that the markets for, for our region here are, are Europe and Southeast Asia. But what you would be missing on is the industrial angle of things, right? Because what's going to happen in the near future is that Europe is going to introduce carbon border taxes on imported products. So the, the steel or, or, or the aluminum that you're going to be exporting from the region, which has a high carbon intensity, will no longer be accepted or will be priced at a higher, a higher, at a, at a, at a higher cost. So what we're seeing is at, at, in the short term, we're going to see blue hydrogen kicking in. Then after that, we're going to see green hydrogen kicking in and exporting. And then after that, we're going to start seeing more and more green hydrogen being used in the domestic industries so that you can produce greener, cleaner products that will be exported. I just want to take a step back. Um, of course, you know, these, this, these are all journeys at the moment, as you've mentioned. Um, it does take some time. It's not going to happen overnight. Um, but something that is occurring at the moment and what we're seeing is you know, globally, of course, the region plays a massive role in that, is this supply crunch. Um, and of course, with, let's say, oil prices uh, above $100 a barrel. Um, do you see that this current situation is going to slow down the energy transition, or do you think it's going to uh, accelerate it? With momentum keeping it on pace. Yeah, yeah I, I think it's definitely going to accelerate it. Uh, what, what we're seeing today in in, uh, in countries that are mostly affected by this uh, crunch is that they are doubling down on their green energy investments. Uh, we're we're hearing of the, uh, you know Germany and the UK being more aggressive on on renewable energy penetration. So it will definitely double down on that. Not only, but in addition to that, if you look at the international oil companies, you look at uh, Total Shell BP, and you look at how they're shifting their portfolio of, of, of investments. They are, it's not like they are investing their hydrocarbon resources, they're not, but 
But the new investments that they're putting in, they're putting them into renewables, they're putting them into electric vehicle sta uh, filling stations, uh, they're, put they're putting them into hydrogen. And obviously that's driven by, by shareholder demand and market demand, right? So the opposite, I think it's actually doubling down on, on, the, on the, the whole energy transition front. You know, you had mentioned the BP, the Totals, the international energy companies progressing and accelerating and of course, uh, changing their portfolios. Here in the region with the national oil companies, you know, there tends to be that conversation of energy security you know, versus energy transition. Um, are you saying that that's impeding progress or do you think things are still moving along regardless of, of what's being communicated in a sense? They are actually embracing it. What, what, uh, what these national oil companies are, are realizing is that the energy transition, uh, more specifically for them around blue hydrogen, is complementary rather than, 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 than uh, hindering their, their business. Right, mm. they are at the end of the day the lowest cost producer of, of oil. Right, their market share for for oil exports will only increase over time because uh, those that are expensive will be carved out of the market. Right, but they see and they've realized that they can complement their hydrocarbons with uh, blue and green hydrogen exports. So they are already developing plans and and piloting assets uh, around uh, blue and green hydrogen. And they are also going in the future to expand beyond that to make sure that their portfolio becomes diversified and also meets the energy transition uh, requirements. Mm. Seems that 15, 20 minutes goes by pretty quick. So we're gonna have to wrap up pretty soon, but I just wanted to finish on one final question. What we're seeing right now is a massive push uh, with initiatives leading up to COP27 in Egypt. Uh, of course, also looking at COP28 in the UAE. Um, over the, the year ahead, what are you what are you expecting to see? Kind of, uh, are, you, are you expecting to see major announcements? Um, kind of a, a major shift in things. Uh, you know, we had the IPCC report that came out, stressing a lot of urgency. I don't know if there was a big uptake of it, um, but what, what, what's kind of the roadmap ahead for this year? What, what should we uh, look out for? I think the uh, I think what we what we've seen over the past year is are the announcements of the net zero targets, which is a great first step. What we what what we will be seeing in COP27 are how are we going to achieve these these targets. So I think countries and governments are busy drafting the strategies along with the initiatives, and we're going to be seeing more of these uh, in in COP27, and then driving implementation all the way from there. Mm. Well, thank you very much, Ramzi, uh, for joining the show today. Uh, of course, Principal at Strategy and Middle East. For all those listening, please feel free to follow him on social media as well as Strategy and, and also Gulf Intelligence, where we will be publishing this interview. But thank you very much, Ramzi. I appreciate your time and your insights, sir. Thank you very much, Brian. Thank you.